Hi guys, it is Tammy with Nurse Minder and today we're going to be talking about the elements that help to create and maintain our blood pressure. Specifically, we'll be looking at the three things that influence blood pressure and the two systems in our body that help us to maintain it. And we're going to take care of all of that right after this. Welcome back, my name is Tammy and this is Nurse Minder and on this channel we do everything nursing. So if you're new here, consider subscribing below so that you get the next video when it's released. Have you ever wondered what's going on inside your body that's actually regulating your blood pressure? Maybe you've gone to those drug stores where you put your arm into the automated machine and it squeezes really hard and seems to last forever. But the readings that you get are either always different or really, really different. Well, there's a few things that are happening inside the body that are helping to regulate that blood pressure and we're going to talk about those next. Now be sure to stay till the end of the video because I will be talking about some of the things that are often tested in nursing exams and things that patients often ask about. So we'll do that after at the end. Now blood pressure is really a summary of three things happening in the cardiovascular system. One is our heart rate, which is measured per minute. The second is our stroke volume, and that's how much blood is squeezed out of the heart with every contraction. And the third is peripheral resistance, and this is those arteries that the blood is being pumped into. How willing are they to accept that blood, and how much are they resisting? So if we were to give an analogy, for example, it's really windy today, this could be considered how many steps I take in a minute. Under normal conditions, Stroke volume is the distance between my steps. So how far am I covering? And then that resistance would be today's really windy. It's super windy and so I have to work much harder to get the same distance. That would be a good analogy to share with your patients. Now in terms of heart rate, there's many things that can impact heart rate, but it is driven in particular by two nerves in the heart and that is the vagal nerve and the accelerator nerve. The vagal nerve is what slows the heart rate down. So when you go to sleep or when you're like, oh, bearing down and holding your breath, it will slow the heart rate. And the accelerator nerve is what increases it. So these two work in tandem, but there's a host of things that can impact our heart rate, which will change our cardiac output and will influence our blood pressure. And I just have a small list here. This is not exhaustive, but activity as we know, exercise, increases the heart rate, hydration. If you're dehydrated in particular, then our heart rate will increase to supplement that movement of fluid. Our oxygenation status, if we are deficient in oxygen, again, the heart rate will increase to impact our cardiac output. Under stress, increased heart rate. Our thyroid, we can have hyper or hypothyroid, so there's some other medical conditions that will influence the functioning of the heart rate illnesses, medications. So you can see there's a variety of things that can influence just this one factor. Factors that affect stroke volume include how much fluid is coming into the ventricle, so we call that preload. And then the heart's ability to actually contract strong enough to eject that fluid out. So for potentially, you maybe have heard people who um, have heart failure or increased heart size, those are things that would affect stroke volume. So ventricular hypertrophy would be an example. And then factors that influence peripheral resistance. So this is the afterload. This is the pressure that the heart needs to generate in order to pump that blood out. So I'm going to write afterload. But this would be the vessel size and how willing it is to accept it. So how compliant is it? And again, there's a whole host of diseases that can create compliance issues. So atherosclerosis is a common one that's plaque in your vessels that will make those vessels more rigid, that they don't have that stretch capacity to take fluid into it. And so here we have a variety of things can affect these three main elements of blood pressure. 
Now, of course, some of this peripheral resistance can be affected by some of the things that are affecting heart rate. So if I'm under stress, I've got that sympathetic nervous system, fight or flight's going, my vessels constrict, and it will influence the resistance at which the heart is pumping against. Okay, so now let's talk about what a blood pressure reading is. So it's measuring that pressure inside the system as a result of heart rate, stroke volume, and resistance. And we end up with what's called a systolic number and a diastolic number. Now you'll notice that the systolic vessel is wider than my diastolic, and that's for a very important reason. Imagine we're hooked up to a water hose and we turn on the tap. All that pressure is coming through. And so this is really my water hose here. And it's turned on and we have maximum pressure in here. So if you were to go and step on that garden hose, you wouldn't be able to really manipulate it because it's full and it's tense. But when you turn the tap off, the pressure goes down, but it doesn't eliminate the water that stays in the hose or in the vessel. There's still some water there. And this would be our diastolic pressure. So systolic is the amount of pressure in the vessel when it is in contraction and diastolic is when the vessel is relaxed. You'll hear a lot about these numbers 120 over 80. Now I know there's been a lot of changes re recently with the guidelines for high blood pressure, but typically 120 and less is considered normal for systolic and 80 or less is considered normal for diastolic. So you can see here that the normal blood pressure is now considered to be less than 120 over 80. There's my systolic and my diastolic. An elevated blood pressure is now between the readings of 120 and 129. Hypertension is when we now see a reading of 130 to 139, and we're starting to see changes in our diastolic, so 80 to 89 milligrams of mercury. Stage two hypertension is anything greater than 140 over 90 diastolic or higher. Okay, now the other two systems that are working in our body to help us maintain our blood pressure are what's known as baroreceptors and the renin-angiotensin-aldosterone system. Now I'm going to talk about this in another video, but just to give you an overview of these two systems, the baroreceptors are measuring pressure, so the stretch that exists in those vessels, and in particular there's two places. One is just off the heart as it's leaving, as the blood is leaving the ventricle to go to the body. We have a baroreceptor. And the other is off the carotid arteries as it's heading towards the brain because the brain likes to be perfused. This one, okay, so coming back, baroreceptors are looking for pressure and they will affect vessel size and heart rate. The RAAS system, the renin angiotensin aldosterone system, will be also assessing for pressure, but it's going to be focused on maintaining water and sodium in the system should our blood pressure go low and getting rid of it should our blood pressure be too high. So there's a quick summary of the elements and systems in place already in our body to help us regulate our blood pressure. Okay, as promised, I mentioned at the end of this video, I would talk about what is often tested for students in nursing exams and what patients often ask about. And to summarize it, it's cardiac output. You're gonna to wanna to remember the factors that affect cardiac output, so heart rate times stroke volume, and that blood pressure is also with um, also has the element of peripheral resistance. So when you put those things together, any question you have that is looking at the patient's cardiovascular system, we'll be looking for those elements. Patients will also ask about cardiac output, but they don't phrase it that way. They'll ask you, what is blood pressure? And so I've given you the hose analogy so that when you need to explain what systolic and diastolic is and what a normal blood pressure would be, you have that prepared. The second NCLEX thing you'll be tested on is the hypertension treatment scale. So you wanna be making sure you recognize what is elevated blood pressure, what is considered to be hypertension, stage one, stage two, and what would be normal. Now be sure to watch the next video on the renin angiotensin aldosterone system and the baroreceptors so you get a little bit more insight into how they're really working behind the scenes to make sure our blood pressure stays in that safe range so our body is refused well with hydration and nutrition. And until next time, guys, make it a great day.